American politics today is more divided than at any point since the Civil War. There are fewer moderate politicians on either side of the political divide, and a spirit of hardened partisanship has made political compromise, even on issues where compromise is needed, all but impossible. With the advent of internet politics and social media, and especially partisan cable news, Americans can insulate themselves from opposing points of view, reaffirming their own prejudices every minute of the day, and so grow more radical and intolerant over time. Rising partisanship is perhaps part of the reason that many Americans, especially millennials, are losing their faith in liberal democracy. In light of our present predicament, one might reasonably wonder whether American politics isn't invariably a struggle for power between the righteous and the wicked. At present, American political life often looks like a brute contest for dominion, where the victors drag the country in their direction without concern or respect for the losers. Current American politics is war. Or is it that politics is always war, no matter the time or place? Can it ever be more than an out-and-out -out struggle? People have wondered this for centuries in times of strife and conflict, whether the conflict is between the orthodox and the heretical, the rational and the superstitious, the racially pure and the impure, or the productive and the parasitic, the story is the same. Politics is an arena of strategic confrontation where parties struggle to defeat their opponents. Even democracy is a gladiatorial encounter. Perhaps the French philosopher Michel Foucault was right to claim that politics is the continuation of war by other means. Countless people agree with Foucault, and the reason why is as simple as it is important. Many worry that they cannot trust people with different beliefs and interests. The presence of widespread disagreement on matters of fundamental importance makes it harder for us to understand one another, and so harder to see each other as persons of sincere and informed goodwill. We are therefore tempted to see our differences with others as irresolvable sources of conflict, and to assume that we must come to blows. Diverse societies cannot sustain social trust. My book, Must Politics Be War, addresses this problem of distrust by exploring the question of which institutional structures can sustain moral peace between diverse persons. The good news is that there are clear cases where people and even nations exhibit social trust, such as when they rely upon other persons to abide by the political, legal, and social rules that govern their day-to-day -day lives. A moral peace between persons is a state of society with a high degree of social trust in institutions constituted and governed by these rules. Institutions that can sustain moral peace between diverse persons then establish a political life that is not war. So how do we achieve moral peace? I begin with the premise that the institutions that can sustain moral peace are those that can be jointly endorsed. Mutually justifiable institutions are ones that each person can follow from sincere moral conviction, and so help assure us that others can embrace these institutions on moral grounds despite their often foreign world views. When institutions are mutually justifiable, therefore, we can trust one another to abide by them despite our differences. I argue that liberal institutions, and only liberal institutions, are mutually justifiable. In particular, I explain why liberal institutions alone provide the conditions for moral peace between diverse persons. Liberal institutions are systems of equal civic, political, and economic rights that protect persons from control and domination by others. Liberal rights are the key. They give each person or group the freedom to live their own lives their own way, and so prevent persons from institutionalizing their own sectarian vision of the good or of justice. Thus, they create an open society, where people are, as Karl Popper famously wrote, faced with personal decisions, rather than living lives governed by rigid social rules that direct everyone to pursue a single vision of the social and common good. A liberal society is open because it is governed by an abstract set of rules, often codified as constitutional rights, that do not specify a single social end that all must pursue. Nor does an open society pursue a single collective vision of justice. Instead, each person and group is free to pursue their own values and visions of the best form of life. 
What about those who do not value liberal institutions? How can they avoid war with liberals? While some will prefer regimes where their own values are politically supreme, even non-liberals have adequate moral reason to endorse a regime of liberal rights as morally binding. On reflection, each person can see that liberal rights are the most they can respectfully demand of persons with incompatible ideologies. Liberal rights, therefore, lay the groundwork for sustaining social trust, since we can all see that others endorse liberal institutional arrangements from their own perspective. When each person is guaranteed a rights-protected life, they have adequate moral reason to ally themselves with their political and economic institutions. Shared recognition of this fact encourages us to socially trust one another to abide by the institutional rules to which we are all subject. Liberal institutions thereby cultivate moral peace and so are not mere cloaks for the will to power. So if you want to avoid warlike polarization, I invite you to consider my argument that only liberal institutions can reconcile us to one another and form the basis for an enduring trust between people who deeply disagree. I hope to convince you to reaffirm our joint commitment to shared life in an open society. Thank you for watching. You can get Must Politics Be War here. And to learn more about my work or to contact me, click here.